way. So don't worry about it. All right. Uh, it's Brother Haki calling from uh, Baltimore. Let's turn our attention now to Brother Tony Browder. Brother Tony Browder, Happy New Year. Hotep, welcome back. Hotep, Brother Carl, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to your listeners. And a big shout out to uh, Brother Hakeem for the wonderful work that he's doing in Baltimore, which is a very unique city in a very unique state. All right. Well, I'm, I know we're going to leave it right there on that issue. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yeah. But first of all, congratulations. Being a grandfather. Let me, let me shout, shout, shout out about that. Uh, uh, grandbaby and, and daughter doing well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Atlantis just uh, returned home from the hospital yesterday. Her, her son was born on uh, Sunday. And uh, it was a phenomenal delivery. Uh, she just came, Atlantis just came home from the hospital yesterday. And what was so interesting, Carl, we were riding back from, from the hospital, Washington Hospital Center. And I was listening to the rerun of yesterday's show, right? This is around 5.30 or so. I'm listening to yesterday's show, and I'm listening to this physician on your show talking about how black women are being marginalized by physicians in the hospital. So I'm getting into the conversation, and Atlantis is on the phone, and then she turns the radio down and then puts the person that she has on the phone on speakerphone so that I can hear, and she's walking Atlantis through the process. She was um, a doctor who was uh, advising Atlantis on, on certain things that needed to be done in the hospital. Uh, she's the daughter, this doctor is the daughter of Atlantis's first uh, boss, uh, Dr. Benita Thompson, who is the director, founder and director of Roots Activity Learning Center, which is an African center school in DC. So she's talking to Atlantis and, and, and cheering her on for doing so good and being an advocate for herself in the hospital. And after they finished the call, I turned the radio back on and Atlantis is listening to the doctor on the radio. She said, wait a minute, that voice sounds familiar. It was the same doctor, it was Dr. A, right? Um, and the beauty of that was that when Atlantis went in, into the hospital, uh, 6 a.m. Sunday morning, uh, the daughter of a good friend of mine, uh, her name is uh, Sister Bill Keese, had been uh, working with Atlantis on, on birthing. Uh, Bill Keese is about 9, 10 years older than Atlantis. She has three adult children now. So she's been down this road before. And she was talking to Atlantis about breathing, about birthing, hypnosis, a whole host of things that I, as a man, knew nothing about, but she had experience with. And she had been working with Atlantis, uh, helping her, helping to prepare her for the process. So when we got to the hospital at 6 a.m., Sister Bill Keith came 30 minutes later, and she was with Atlantis every step of the way, reminding her on, on, on breathing and, and being calm and making decisions. And I watched these two sisters work together. Well, when it got to the point where Atlantis's water was about to break, Sister Bill Keith left the room. And then three black doctors came in. It was an elderly doctor who was taking the lead on uh, on this procedure. It was a young intern who the elderly doctor was walking through the process. And then there was another uh, sister, OBG Whitehead, who was overseeing everything. And brother, I sat back and watched these three sisters, three different generations, work with my daughter and walk her through this process just that less than 20 minutes after Atlantis's water broke, she gave birth to her son. And, and, and they, they calmed her down. They, they talked with her about pushing and pushing, and yes, it's going to hurt you, but you've got to push through it. They explained everything to her that was happening. And I had such a great, I took such great delight in watching these three black women work with my daughter and care for her as if she was their own daughter, as if she was their own sister, as she was their best friend. And I understood very clearly what black women, how black women feel when they talk about going into hospitals, going into doctor's offices and being ignored simply because they're black, because they're dealing with a, a physician who is 
who is you know European or, or, or non-black who don't see them as human beings. And to hear Dr. A uh, yesterday evening give voice to a reality that too many of our, our people, women and men, experience whenever they go to the doctor's office, whenever they go to a hospital. These issues are real. But to know that there are sisters uh, and brothers out there who care for their patients, and, and we have to seek them out, but also we have, to, we have a responsibility as patients to go to the hospital, to go to our doctor's office, uh, prepared to have some knowledge about whatever the, the issue is that we're dealing with, to have intelligent conversations with these caregivers so that they can provide the best quality of care possible. So uh, I'm, I'm grateful to be a grandfather. Um, there's been a few complications with my grandson, some respiratory issues, but he should be home tomorrow. And, you know, there's nothing more helpless than to see your child or your grandchild uh, being uh, being discomforted, and you are unable to do anything to help them, and you're at the mercy of these healthcare professionals who know their job, and you just watch them do what they are trained to do. But you also have to be engaged with them. You also have to ask them questions. You know, I'm the type of patient who wants to know everything that's going on with my care or anybody else's care. Uh, I want to know the prescriptions. I want to know the procedures. And what I found, Carl, is that when doctors are engaging with a patient or uh, a family member of a patient who asks pointed questions, who comes prepared with information about medication, the quality of care shifts dramatically. So I'm encouraging everyone who has a medical issue to, number one, stay on top of your medical issue. You don't just go to the doctor to be healed. You as a patient uh, are an active participant in your healing process. And if we're really honest, doctors and nurses work for you because it is the money that comes out of your pocket or out of uh, your insurance company's pocket that pays their salary, that pays for all the medication you're getting. And when you act in a proactive manner, the quality of the relationship between you and your health care provider shifts dramatically. All right. Hold that thought right there, Brother Tony. We've got to take a short break. When we come back, though, I want you to tell us if there are any rituals, African rituals, that are in the birthing process. You, you were there when uh, Dr. Welsh made her transition, and you shared some of the uh, rituals that our sisters, that the sisters were there at the, at the hospital at the time. But share with us when we get back, though, so some of us can learn some of these uh, processes that take place. Family, you want to join this conversation with Tony Browder? Reach out to us at 800 450 7876, your phone calls in four minutes right here in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB. If you're in the DMV, we're on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. And good morning once again, family. 20 minutes after the top of the hour with our guest, chemitologist Tony Browder. And we're going to talk about uh, Dr. Anoka Rashidi and also uh, talk about the ASA uh, project as well as some other projects that Tony's working on. But before we do all of that, though, you mentioned that now he's a granddad. And first of all, Tony Atlantis, did she name the child and uh, your son, your grandson? And tell us about if there were any rituals that we as Africans go through? Because you mentioned you were there when and Dr. Wilson made her transition, and many of us learned, you know, what should be done during that period. So I'm just wondering if there's anything that we should be aware of during the birthing period experience. Oh, for sure, Carl. Well, um, Atlantis's son was born at uh, 8.43 a.m. on Sunday. He weighed 4.8 pounds. He was... Um, He's under five pounds, which means that typically a child under five pounds has to spend some time at the um, uh, NICU unit at the hospital until their weight gets up. But that wasn't an issue. And that just is a, has a small frame, so it was expected that her child would be rather small. So he's fine, and he should be home tomorrow. Um, and the name 
His name is um, Anthony. Uh, she and, and the father decided to name the child after me. His middle name is Taharka. Um, his last name is Browder. So he carries he carries uh, the same energy as both Atlantis and I. Um, Atlantis's name, middle name is Tai, named after a uh, Queen T in Kemet. So all three of us have the same initials, ATB. And all three of our names are first name is three syllables, second name is two syllables, uh, third name is three syllables. So it's all about, you know, having a name that has a certain vibration, that has a certain frequency, that has a certain energy, uh, because I understand that um, children are returning ancestors. Newborn children are returning ancestors. Now, this is a philosophy, a, a way of life that is acknowledged primarily in countries outside of America, uh, countries that have strong indigenous traditions, so you will find among Native people here in North America, Central America, and South America, you'll find these traditions among uh, African people throughout the continent and around the diaspora. And part of this understanding, Carl, is rooted in the fact that there is no death. Uh, last month when I was on your show, I think it was the 17th of December, uh, I, I wound up talking about this idea of the uh, Rahimi Misu, the repetition of the birth, this idea of reincarnation, this idea that the body is temporary, but the soul is eternal, and souls come back into bodies in order to advance through life over multiple lifetimes. And if we understand the reality of that process, then knowing that there is no death allows you to live your life fierce, fearlessly and also allows you to understand the significance of what, you know, Baba Dick Gregory first turned me on to around 1973, this idea of karma, cause and effect. We create the, the, the realities that manifest themselves in our lives. And if we truly understand the interconnectedness of all of these processes, if we are souls uh, spiritual beings having a human experience, ancestors who have returned from the ancestral realm into the physical realm to continue our life's journey and connect all of these understandings together, then we will realize that ancestors are born into the world as new children. So in um, Burkina Faso, among the Dagara people, they have a ritual known, known as a, a birthing ritual where a pregnant mother goes and meets with um, a healer, a seer, a teacher who does a reading, and they will determine which ancestor is going to be returning in the newborn child that the mother is about to bring into the world. So if you want to identify which ancestor soul is coming back into the body of that child, then you know what to name. You know the sex of that child. You know what to name that child because that name will, will describe their life force, the energy that's going to flow through them that will help them accomplish their goals. And you have a clear idea of, of uh, the work that they're going to do as, as young adults and adults. So it's in um, um, the book called The Spirit of Intimacy by the wife of Maladoma Somme. I'm, I'm blanking on her first name right now. But she lays all of this out as a part of their culture. And so in African tradition, uh, you, you're born, and the village is responsible for helping the parents raise the child. So that, that phrase that Hillary Clinton popularized, it takes a village to uh, raise a child, is one portion of a, a kind saying, which is it takes a woman to have a child, but it takes the village to raise it. So everybody in the village, everybody in the community has a vested interest in, the, in welcoming this returning ancestor into the village and then helping them to stay on their life's path for the benefit of the community. So if everybody around you understands that process, they realize that we're all working together for a collective goal. So that one of the downsides of enslavement 
and the miseducation of African people is to erase that memory, that we are just here as individuals, that we have not lived before. This is the only life we live, and when we die, we go to heaven and hell. That is nonsense. But when you can reorient yourself to that which makes historical, cultural, and spiritual sense, you're able to tap into uh, a deeper source of power, which we've always carried with us. And then as that child progresses, they go through right, a passage which prepares them for adulthood. And then they move through junior adulthood, senior adulthood, junior eldership, senior eldership. And then after the age of 73, they become a wise elder. So I'm looking forward to entering my wise eldership phase of life uh, this year. And then the elders will ultimately die. And after they die, they will become ancestors. So in traditional African societies, 40 days after your death is your ascension into ancestorhood. And then once you ascend to ancestorhood, you've, you've gone through the process that is quite well known in the Nile Valley as the weighing of the soul, where your heart, which is considered to be the seat of the soul, is weighed opposite the feather of Ma, and you had to declare your innocence by reciting the 42 admonitions of Ma. And if your heart is as light as a feather, it means that you've lived a righteous life in that lifetime. That then pays dividends and prepares you for your next lifetime when you incarnate. And so it's the process of uh, conception where the sperm from the man and the egg from the woman uh, then activate that egg and makes it possible for life to begin again in the womb of that woman. And then the, the soul of that ancestor comes in and, and lives within that body and is born again. That is the whole process of being born again. That is the process of the life cycle. And when you understand that, then it means that there are certain things that the man and woman should do prior to conception. Because there is an understanding in many traditions that the consciousness of the man and the woman at the time of conception determines the consciousness of the child. There's also an understanding that children choose their parents. So in the ancestor realm, uh, if a person understands what their mission is in life, or what Dr. Wilson referred to as your global assignment, then you will look for the parents who will uh, come together to create this life that will allow you to fulfill your cosmic assignment, your life's purpose. So if you understand these concepts and ideas, then life becomes a joy. Life is not something to be fearful of. And and then when a person is is ending their life, as, as Dr. Wilson was and, and several others, if you're there in the room with that person, and, and last month when I was on your show call, I talked about being at my mother's bedside as she was taking her last breath. And if you understand that the soul is about to leave this body and the body would just become a shell, then there are specific things that you can say, specific things that you can do to prepare that soul on its journey into the ancestral realm where they will be greeted by other loving ancestors. You can open that 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 spirit door for them and ease this transition from life into ancestorhood so that they can then be better prepared to begin this journey to come back into uh, life again as an infant and the process starts again. So this is this is it in a nutshell. Uh, but the other thing that I'm so excited about, Carl, is that I hope and I pray that uh, the, the soul that has returned uh, in the body of my grandson is the soul of my grandfather so that I will have an opportunity to be the grandfather to my grandchild, which my grandfather was to me. My creativity uh, comes to me from my grandfather. I was the first grandchild in, um, in my mother's family. My mother was 16 when I was born. So my first five years of life, I grew up in her household. So my mother's parents were like my parents. And I latched on to specific personality traits 
from my grandfather and my grandmother that I've carried with me all my life. And now that they're both ancestors, those are, are two souls that, that I reach out to, that I pour libation to on a regular basis because I knew them. I know that they're real. I know that they love me. And I know how to petition them to come forward and assist me when I ask for assistance. So all of these concepts, Carl, are, are real concepts that have been erased from our historical cultural memory by our oppressors in order to keep us afraid and ignorant of the true power that we possess. And, you know, my interest in now Valley civilization is really just an entree into understanding African consciousness, African history, and African spirituality. So it doesn't matter to me what part of Africa you connect with. What's important is that you connect with some part of Africa because that is who we are. And when we begin to recover and restore those memories, which our uh, former and current oppressors know are the key to our spiritual power. When we recover that, then there is nothing that our oppressor can do to limit the activation of the soul force, which we carry with us all of our lives. All right. I'm Brother Tony Comper on a break, and, and uh, I just got a tweet from Greg. He says he was just in tears hearing what you just said. But he also had a question about what happens in that 40 days after after you, the start of the transition. I'll let you explain this when we get back. Uh, what happens in the 40 days before you're accepted in? Where is the soul? So he, he wants to like that. But he says, he, he says, man, I'm in tears here when Brother Tony's talking about family. <laughs> To call up some of your friends, tell them that Tony Brown is on the radio. You're going to learn something this morning. 26 minutes away from the top of the hour. As I mentioned, we've got to step aside, take a short break. We're back in four minutes, though, right here in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB. If you're in the DMV, we're on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. <coughs> WOL, where information is power. And good morning once again, family. 22 minutes away from the top of the hour with our guest, chemitologist Tony Browder. We'll get back to Tony in a moment. I must remind you that tomorrow is Friday, and we're going to give you another chance to free your mind, think for yourself, and reach out to us on our Open Phone Friday program. We'll begin promptly at 6 a.m. Eastern Time, right here in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB. Also in the DMV on FM 95.9 and AM 1450 WOL. I don't want to get some other things, uh, Brother Tony, but uh, Greg, and Greg says he's a growing A man, and he's in tears at what you just said, but he, he wants to know what happens during this 40-day duration before the soul moves on. So let's look at uh, 40 days. Let's look at the number 40. Uh, the number four is a number that represents a foundation or a base. You know, masons take their oath on the square. Uh, the original size of D.C., according to Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, was D.C. was to be a 10-mile square that was oriented to the four cardinal points of the compass, north, south, east, and west. And it was Benjamin Banneker's job to orient uh, this capital city to these cardinal points so that it could be aligned to certain celestial bodies so that certain things could happen. Majority of the people responsible for founding this country were Masons, but then it makes sense that the capital of um, the most powerful nation in human history was conceived to be designed as a 10-mile square, as the foundation for which these white men were going to rule this country and rule the world. If we think in terms of the Bible and the number 40, Jesus fasted for 40 days. Uh, Noah and the ark, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Jonah spent 40 days in the belly of the whale. So four of the number 40 represents a foundation or, or shifting from one reality to another reality. So the 40 days that a soul spends between the time that it leaves its earthly body and the time it ascends into ancestorhood is, is a time frame for that soul to review its life, right? To, to see if it fulfilled its cosmic assignment in this particular incarnation. So you look at, were you fair to others? Did you tell the truth? Uh, were you violent? Uh, 
against others? Did you did you acknowledge the creator of your people? So these 42 admonitions of uh, of Mahat, these 42 declarations of innocence, are your are your final exam. And so as you review your life, you then begin to understand how successful you were in completing the job from your previous lifetime. And then as you ascend into the realm of an ancestor with this higher, clearer consciousness on a soul level, then you are in a better position to then give guidance to those physical souls that you left behind on the earthly plane. So I remember as as a child, <clears throat> growing up in my grandparents' household, how my grandmother, who was a deeply religious person, uh, whenever she was faced with making a difficult decision, she would say, well, I need to sleep on it. And then after taking this thought, this this decision, uh, these concerns uh, to bed with her in her sleep, then she would wake up in the morning and say, well, you know, I know what to do now. A little birdie told me X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C. As a child, I didn't understand the symbolic language that my grandmother was speaking. And I think to some extent, she didn't understand the cultural symbolic language that she was speaking when she said a little birdie told her to do X, Y, Z, and A, B, and C. When she was dreaming, her soul went into the ancestor realm and communicated with her ancestors who she gave this problem to. And in the ancestral dimension, uh, there's this thing which we can call, for lack of a better term, timelessness, where the past, the present, and the future all exist simultaneously, right? Um, And quantum physics is kind of addressing that issue now by saying that everything uh, exists everywhere all at the same time. String theory and all these other ideas are scientific ways of acknowledging African spirituality. But when my grandmother said that a little birdie told her, it took me... 30 some ideas to understand that this little birdie that she was talking about was the Ba, right? And the Ba is that image you see painted in, in, in tombs and on papyri in Kemet and Kush and other areas of the Nile Valley where you see a bird with a human head. That is the Ba. And that represents the soul of the person who comes from the ancestor realm back into the physical realm to communicate with those that they left behind. So the role of living is so that when you die, you can become an honorable ancestor. Now, let's be clear. Not all ancestors are honorable ancestors. Not all ancestors are names that you call when you pour libation because some people need to stay on the other side. Some people have lessons that they have to learn, lessons that may take them multiple lifetimes before they even get to the part uh, in their lives where they're ready to learn the lesson. And, and And that's just the way it is for those souls. But every soul has a purpose. Every soul has a value. And so if you understand that that we are souls having a human experience, we can call on other souls, other ancestral souls, to provide us guidance. And the film Black Panther, both Black Panther films, as a matter of fact, were all about showing us the power of the ancestor realm. The first Black Panther film, uh, when T'Challa uh, won the mantle, became the Black Panther, uh, he was buried, and that symbolic burial was the burial of his physical body so that his spiritual body could go into the ancestor realm where he met his father, right? And upon meeting his father, uh, the most powerful words in that film still resonate in my body because at the time I saw the film in 2017, I had not met my biological father. So when T'Challa told his father that he wasn't ready, his father said, well, have I not prepared you for life, how to be king? I've shown you this, I've shown you that. And then T'Challa said, no, Baba, I'm not ready to be without you. And then his father, as an ancestor, told him, any father who has not prepared his child for, for their death has failed as a father. And he asks the quintessential question, have I ever failed you? 
And T'Challa had to acknowledge, he had to wake up, his soul was activated and said, no, Baba, you have not failed me. So when he reawakened from that experience, he was fully prepared, fully charged to live as the king in the Black Panther. In the second Black Panther film, when he died, that film begins with his mother and priests pouring libation, calling the ancestors, right? And then he ascended into the ancestor realm. So these two films were a way of, of, of the creator, of the ancestors, introducing to a population that needed this knowledge the most, the power of ancestorhood. And then last year also, we had this incredible film called The Woman King. And while a lot of people were fixating on certain aspects of, of that film, I fixated on the larger dimension of that film, which also dealt with ancestors. And the closing scene of the film, which some people missed if they left early, the closing scene of that film was when one of the warrior uh, priestesses was pouring libation, calling on the souls of those ancestors who died on the battlefield with them to come back because they knew that they were going to need their energies for the battles to come. So what, what I really want people to get at this phase in, in, in my learning and teaching experience, what I want people to get is the power of ancestral acknowledgement, the power of ancestral intelligence. That is real. That is the reason why we are still alive, why our oppressor has not been able to obliterate us from the face of this earth as they've done other people that they have conquered and enslaved. We are alive today because of our connection with our ancestors and those who are doing more than living but thriving are thriving because they have connected to that golden thread which links us to our ancestors and allows their genetic memory to flow through us. So I'll say it again, ancestral intelligence is the only AI that matters to conscientious African people. All right, 12 away from the top of the hour. Got, got some reports for you, Brother Tony. I sent some, because people are sending me emails and, and tweets and that, I sent you an email. But they were, they're pleased with what you said. <clears throat> but I, I got a tweet from uh, uh, from a brother, uh, he calls himself a Marleyite. He says, Bob Marley he talked about, the, when he talked about the birds, he said the Marley sang a song about, I woke up this morning, smiled with the rising sun, and three little birds uh, little stopped birds. by my, right. my doorstep mm-hmm. and told me that every little thing is going to be all right. So you just mm-hmm. want to share. I'm sure you're familiar with that particular song, probably. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and see, you know, the other thing about about birds is birds are are exist within nature, right? And they're animals and insects uh, and plants, minerals that are a part of nature. If we're clear about Nile Valley studies and Nile Valley studies, you know, I'm you know, I'm following uh, Dr. Charles Finch's lead. When we talk about Nile Valley culture, Nile Valley civilization, we're talking about those countries from the White Nile, the Blue Nile, all the way down to the Mediterranean Sea. We're talking about inner Africa, not just Egypt. Uh, We're talking about Kush. We're talking about Ethiopia. We're talking about Kenya. We're talking about Uganda. We're talking about the source of the Nile River, the source of life. And so nature is our first teacher. And in the Nile Valley, uh, the word nature was derived from the word nature, which means a principle or an aspect of divinity or a principle or aspect of the creator or a principle or aspect of God. And so it's, we learn from the trees. We learn from the birds, from, the, from all of the animals, because they're more connected to the creator than we are. Have you ever seen a bird take flying lessons? Have you ever seen um, a, a squirrel take lessons on how to uh, climb a tree or a fish take lessons on how to swim? They are born with this innate intelligence. And because they are connected to the creative source, then the creative source moves through them and guides them to do the things that they were genetically born to do. Human beings are the same way. But we live in a society where we are connected from the nature. We are connect. We are disconnected from from God, so to speak. So we've got to go to somebody who would teach us how to 
uh, go to somebody who's an intermediary for the creator as opposed to knowing how to, how to directly tap into that creative power. Uh, and, and the reason why this process is in place, particularly in America, is because there's money to be made by those folk in the pulpit. And I was so pleased to hear Reverend Willie Wilson on this show this past Monday, because Reverend Willie Wilson is one of the few uh, Christian ministers here in D.C. that I know personally whose understanding of Christ, whose understanding of the Bible transcends the King James Version. He is a person who connects African spiritual traditions with Christianity in order to deliver a message to his, his parishioners such that they're able to understand who they are and have a deeper connected connection to source. So these are lessons that we're here to learn. There are people who, who are here to teach these lessons, and it's simply a matter of people being willing to wake up, being unafraid, and allow themselves to learn from people who can guide them toward the light. All right, nine away from the top. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, Brother Renoka Rashidi, Dr. Renoka Rashidi, his documentary. But Sandra is, is in Baltimore, has a quick question for you on line one. Good morning, Sandra. You're on with Tony Browder. Good morning, Carl, and good morning to the ambassador, and congratulations on your son. I, I have two questions. My first question is this. Oh, oh, I also would like to thank you for explaining the Black Panther, because a lot of people went to see that movie and they don't have a clue what it was all about, and also the Woman King. So thank you. My first question is this. What, was the, what happens when people kill each other and they die and they have to go to their ancestors? What happens then? And also what happens when people take their own life and they have to go to the ancestors? And also, mm-hmm. what about mixing your blood? You're not supposed to mix. Is that, is that one? Uh, I tell you what, what uh, Sanjay, we'll, we'll, get, we'll take the break. When we come back, we'll, we'll let uh, Tony respond to your questions. Okay. Interesting questions, okay, though. Thank, thank you, you Sandra. I'll, I'll hang up and listen. All right. Sandra's calling us from Baltimore, okay. six away from the top. As I mentioned, we got to step aside, take a short break. We're back in four minutes, though, with uh, uh, Brother Tony's response and your phone calls as well at 800-450-7876 right here <clears throat> in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB and also in the DMV on FM. 95.9 and AM 1450 WOL where information is power <clears throat> and good morning again family minute after the top there with our guest the chemitologist Tony Browder and, and, and brother Tony we can get to uh, Dr. Renoka Rashidi's documentary after you finish responding to Sister Sandra's questions do you remember the questions? Oh, yeah, I, I, I wrote them down, Carl. <laughs> Maybe it's not what it used to be. But, uh, yeah, man, uh, the, the three questions that Sister Sandra posed to me before the break were three questions that I could spend an entire Carl Nelson show elaborating on. But I'll, I'll do it in two minutes. Uh, the first question had to do with uh, murderers. What happens to murderers? So if we stop and think for a minute, <clears throat> one of the... Um, admonitions that one has to acknowledge at the scene of the wing of the soul is that you have not committed murder. So in Kemet, it was understood that to take another life is a crime against nature. It's a crime against the nature. It's a crime against God. However, when we get to the Ten Commandments, which were distilled from the 42 admonitions of Ma'at, we have Moses uh, telling his people, thou shalt not kill. But then again, it's all right for for people of that faith to kill people who are not of that faith. So I had a pastor from New York tell me that, he said the Ten Commandments only apply to Hebrew people. They don't apply to everyone else. So you can lie to folk who are not part of this chosen group. You can kill someone who's not a part of that chosen group, which maybe helps to explain the bloodletting that we see going on in Gaza right now. Um, so, so one should not kill someone else. If you understand that they are an extension of you, that we are all connected, then in some sense, when you're killing someone, when you're hating someone, you hate yourself. So in that larger context, what a war is all about. 
Wars are about killing other people, violating the very laws of God that we claim that we want to honor and adore. Uh, we should revisit this whole thing about war and murder. Uh, she asked another question about suicide. What happens uh, with people who commit suicide? There's a wonderful book called Rebel in the Soul, which was a retelling of an ancient uh, Nile Valley papyri where a person was contemplating suicide. Um, and and when you if you read that text, and I believe it was written in in the in the Middle Kingdom around you know 2000 BC, almost 4,000 years ago, you see a person saying that they are ready com- to commit suicide because people are killing other people in their community. People are stealing from other people in their community. People are disrespecting other people in the community. You would swear you're reading. Uh, uh, a current newspaper, but we're talking about someone lamenting the quality of life 4,000 years ago. And because of all the despair that they were dealing with in their lifetime, they were contemplating suicide. But then in this papyri, the person's soul comes to them and says, to die to you today was would be uh, an abomination. You are here to live, not to die. And com- Hopefully we didn't just lose uh, Brother Tony. It sounds like his, his uh, line dropped, uh, Kevin. So see if we can get him back for us. Interesting conversation, family. Call up a couple of friends and tell them that Tony Brown is on the radio here discussing discussing what happens when we make that transition. You know, he told us he was in the room with Dr. Wilson, made her transition. That's why I went and asked him about the, the other rituals that, uh, that our, our ancestors practice when it comes to birth, the birthing process. And he's going to tell us about the, uh, the Dr. Anoka Rashidi documentary. It's been the, in the in the works for quite some time, and I know they've been doing some editing. Hopefully, we get a chance to talk about the Asa Restoration Project and also the Clark Enhanced History Project as well. And as you mentioned, something about movies because you know, Brother Tony, kind of like Dick Gregory, Mark Manheim, when they go see a movie, we just go for entertainment. They they've, they're watching all the symbolisms of, of, of what the movie is, what they're trying to you know, the, 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 what they're trying to tell us. You know, sub. sub uh, Brother Tony's back, so Brother Tony, I'll let you finish your thought. Sure. I'm, I'm not sure at what point I was disconnected, but uh, I was talking about this book, The Rebel in the Soul, where the soul of the person who is contemplating suicide uh, basically let that person know that your life is too valuable to end. Yes, you may be upset because of what is happening, but you are here for a purpose. So we have been given information. We've been given texts uh over the millennia that helps us to address many of the issues that we may encounter in life. Uh, The last question that Sandra raised was this issue of of, of race mixing. And so the question then becomes, you know, the hard loves who the hard loves on one very basic level. But the question then becomes, uh, you know, what, what are you dealing with with circumstances like Adolf Hitler, who believed in the superiority of the Aryan race, who outlawed uh, race uh, mixing, or or are you uh, crossing over uh, because you're addicted to white, uh, because you hate black? So all of these issues are issues that really need to be evaluated because it's not just your life that you're dealing with; it's the life of the lives that you will bring into the world. So it's important for me to stress the fact that a person should know themselves first, know who you are, love yourself. First, if there are issues that are bothering you and everybody has issues, get to the bottom of those issues so that you can resolve them and become a better person. That's what psychiatrists are for. That's what psychologists are for. That's what scholars are for, to help us become better people. So we can't solve the problems in life by ourselves. We go to experts who can help us resolve these issues so that we can continue our our soul journey our cosmic assignment and become the best person possible in this particular lifetime. So with your permission, I'll segue over to the, uh, before you do, yeah, yeah, before you do that Uh though, because you once mentioned that, you know, death happens when we've completed our cosmic assignment. Can you touch on that a little bit for us? Sure. You know, um, I think there was a book, uh, why bad things happen to good people, uh, that laments, the sorrow that people experience when a child dies, 
early in life. Uh, the greatest, the greatest fear of any parent is to bury your child before your child buries you. And um, you know, we have to ask ourselves when when misery strikes a person or a people, we have to ask ourselves why is that happening? Everything happens for a reason, right? Sometimes some souls. Uh, only have to be on this planet for a short period of time in order to fulfill their cosmic assignment so that they can prepare themselves for their next assignment, their next return. And it's very difficult to, to understand that if you're caught up in grief, if you're just dealing with this situation from an emotional standpoint and are separated from understanding and internalizing the spiritual reasons why we are here. So it's about balancing both aspects of ourselves and, and realizing and understanding that everything happens for a reason. And when we can detach ourselves from the um, emotionalism of life and begin to look at things from a, a, a spiritual dimension, then we can gain some balance in our understanding of what's really going on. Uh, a, a quick aside, you, you have a frequent guest, uh, Brother Tyrone Power, on your show, uh, former uh, African-American FBI agent. And I remember Atlantis and I meeting him maybe 20, 20 years or so ago. Uh, we were going to a book fair somewhere in Ohio. And this was during the time, this was right after, this is right after 95, 96, right after the Million Man March, when black churches were being burned. And I remember having a conversation with that brother. And he was telling us, that the churches that were being burned were actually being firebombed, but the FBI was labeling them burnings because bombings have to be investigated by the FBI. If it's a burning, then this investigation can be handled by the local police who may, in fact, have had a hand in burning that church. So he said that um, what FBI officials know when speaking to the black community about issues of church burnings, church bombings, or issues of whether or not crack is being distributed by the federal government in your community, that when they go into the meeting, they know the black folk are going to be emotional. They're going to be all over the place. And you say whatever you need to say in that instance to calm their emotions. And when you leave, they'll forget and they will never hold you accountable. So what I'm saying here is that, yeah, we emote, but we also need to think, we also need to process, we also need to ground ourselves in other areas of knowledge so that we can bring that knowledge, that spirituality, the power, that ancestral power that comes with tapping into that, that, that ancestral intelligence so that we can speak, think, and act in such a manner that we can achieve our objectives and not continue to feed into the objectives of our oppressors. Oh, yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's a 10 after the top of the hour. Let's go move over now to uh, Dr. Renoka Rashidi, the documentary. So this has been a, a labor of love for the past two years. Uh, the documentary, uh, the final edit of the documentary was done in uh, early December, and it's now available to the general public. So we are finalizing the process. The documentary is now available on Vimeo, uh, where one can uh, go to Vimeo, which is a, um, a service that allows you to, to download and upload uh, films. Um, so it's available now on Vimeo. We're also working to get it on other streaming platforms, Amazon, Amazon Prime, Apple TV. Uh, we're in the process of doing that. But we also are making the documentary available for. Oh, wow. Uh, hopefully we haven't lost Tony again because we're going to find out, you know, what to do with the uh, doctor. Dr. Renoka Rashidi uh, documentary because we're coming up on Black History Month. Love to see it, Black History Month and some of these uh, movie premieres that are out as well. Pan African Film Festival out in L.A. and the, uh, places like that where they have these Black Film Festivals and show Dr. Renoka Rashidi. 
especially since they're trying to ban our, our books now, family. We, we have to, you know, be proactive and get the story of, of Dr. Renoka Rashidi into the hands, especially of our children, so they can, they can understand the life and times of Dr. Renoka Rashidi. So one of the things that Brother Tony said, that once your cosmic assignment is over, that's that's when you're gonna you know that's when you're gonna leave here. You know, and I just put it straight up like that. So and and basically, there all of us are assigned have an assignment on this planet. Some of us are still trying to figure out what that assignment is. But once you've figured it out, and once you once you've uh, you've completed your assignment, once you've done what you're supposed to do on this planet, that's when you make your exit. So he was talking about the grief uh, issue that you know people shouldn't be grieving because you know that person has completed their assignment. They've done what they were supposed to do while they were on this planet. Planet. So now they're moving to the next realm. That's why it was important for him to explain us what happens when when you make that transition. That that forty day. What happens before you move into the other space? When you when when the judgment day comes, as some people call it, when when, when the, you you're quizzed on whether you know you violated you violated the uh, the the admissions of, of Maat because you'll be judged on on you'll be judged on, on a feather the balance that's why you don't get upset or you don't get too angry when people attack you or just say something or even when people praise you you try to stay on an even keel that's what it's all about that's what's balance some people call it karma so if you do something bad something bad's gonna happen to you some people react on that level because they say oh that's why I, I, I'm not going to treat it or say anything negative or say anything because it's going to come back to me or come back on my children but it's basically the same thing it's all it's all, all it's all about balance that's what I our ancestors called it, you know, some people call it karma, and and, and, and if it, it, it did any uh, philosophy in college, they teach about that as well, that it, there is a balance it's in life, that's basically what it is in life. But anyway, we're going to take a short break, I hope we get Brother Tony back on the phone as we are now up to the period where we got to take the break, and we'll be back in four minutes at 14 after the top of the hour, right here in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB, also in the DMV, we're on FM 95.9 and AM 1450 W-O-L, or information is power. And good morning, family. If just join us, I guess, is Tony Brown. Tony, one of our top scholars here it, with us right now. If you'd like to speak to him, 800-450-7876. Before we go back to him, though, let me just remind you that tomorrow is Friday, so we're going to give you a chance to free your mind. Reach out to us in our Open Phone Friday program. Uh, our number, of course, again, is 800-450-7876, and we start promptly at 6 a.m. Eastern Time, right here in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB and also in the DMV on FM 95.9 and AM 1450 WOL. So, Brother Tony, I'm going to let you finish. Tell us about, uh, you were telling us about, first you were telling us about the, the ASA Restoration Project and now the Clark Enhanced History Project. Right. So the Clark Enhanced History Project was is created specifically in order to tell the backstory of African people before our enslavement. As Dr. Clark reminded us, if you begin your history in slavery, everything since then looks like progress. Dr. Clark also told us that, that over half of human history was over before the first European wore a shoe or lived in a house with a window. So we're documenting 8,000 years of African excellence, uh, history, culture, knowledge that precedes our enslavement so that we will have a context of who we were before our world was turned upside down so that we can intentionally engage in acts of Sankofa, reach back into the past and claim the best of our ancestral knowledge so that we can then engage in Kofa, move forward with that knowledge in our present lives so that we can create the world that our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren are to inherit. That is the reason why we're alive, Carl, and anyone who doesn't get that is wasting their life. All right, 19 away from the top of the island. We had a, uh, actually, it was an email that somebody sent me, and I forwarded it to you, but he he says... He changed his life changed when he heard about the Browder files. He says, I think he met you or heard you in, in St. Louis. Can you tell us about the Browder files? Sure. Well, from the Browder file was my first book, and that writing of that book came uh, about as a result of my very first appearance on the uh, Kathy Hughes Morning Show on WOL in November of 1986. Uh, I was on the show. I was supposed to do an hour. I was hitting it with Miss uh, Miss Hughes so well that she had me on for two hours and then invited me back 
the following Monday to do two more hours. But um, I was talking about history, the things that I love talking about, and I was invited to write uh, some articles in the Washington Afro, which were entitled uh, From the Browder File. Two years later, I published uh, my first book, From the Browder File, which has been a perennial bestseller, and I am now in the process of writing the third volume of Browder File Essays, which is titled Why Kemet Matters, in which I'm going to be doubling down on Kemet and the Nile Valley and why it's so important for people of African ancestry to know that this is an indigenous African culture and to understand why others have been attempting to appropriate it so that they can separate us from this ancestral intelligence which can empower us for the very difficult days that we're going to be facing throughout 2024, 2025, and 2026. So the Browder file is is following the, the creed of WOL with the understanding that information is power. We provide information, give you the tools to know how to utilize it in such a fashion that you can empower yourself. Hopefully that then will help you to empower other people of the black lives that matter to you. Oh, and also, Tony, at 17 away from the top of the hour, your trip, a local trip, Egypt on the Potomac, how did that come about? And is, is it still going on? Right. The Egypt on the Potomac trip is an activity that we started in 1986. I've been at this for a few minutes, Carl. Uh, it is a seasonal activity. Our 2024 season be- runs from April through November. Our public field trips are the first Saturday of each month uh, at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Someone can go to our website, ikg-info.com, and purchase tickets for Egypt on the Potomac. It's a three-hour field trip where we take you around the city and show you the physical evidence to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that America's founding fathers studied Nile Valley civilization, studied Kemet, and incorporated that knowledge into the architectural landscape of D.C. in order to empower themselves to accomplish the things that this nation has accomplished within the past 200 years. So, as Brother James Small says, when you understand history, you erase the mystery and can assume your rightful place in this world. So that's one of the many things that we've been doing, uh, that IKG has been doing for over 40 years. And as long as I'm living, we'll continue doing this and passing it down to the next generation. So my daughter's been following in in my footsteps, working with me uh, since she was eight years old. And my grandson will also follow in our footsteps. As a matter of fact, I've already started working on my grandson's first book, which we will publish when he was five years old. When he becomes five years old, it will be his, my birthday gift to him. Uh, And and so such that my, this is what I'm envisioning. This is what I'm going to bring into manifestation. My grandson will publish his first book when he's five years old and he will beat his mother's record by three years. All right. Good good to hear that. And let me just say this. If you live in the DMV, you got to take this trip. You, you, you've got to you can't live here and not know all these edifices, these buildings or what they really mean. You know, it's great to, when you pick up your friends at, at BWI or on Reagan National, and you taking them home or to, to, the, to the hotel. You can point out these things and you can, you know, sound like an expert. All did you learn from what being on, on this trip, Egypt on the uh, Potomac? You, you know, if you want, you can tell them it was Tony Browder who taught you. But yeah. If you live in the DMV, and if you're if you're visiting, especially I know it's kind of chilly right now, but in the summertime, springtime, make sure that you sign up and, and get to see uh, Washington D.C. what it really is. But brother, tell me, I ask you about movies because you talked about movies earlier, and you and I mentioned Mark Vanheim and, and Dick Gregory. You guys, when you go to the movies, you you look at it differently from the rest of us. For most of us, it's entertainment or escapism. You know, we're trying to get away and just just trying to relax, but. What is it about what you, when you go to the movies, you're looking for certain things. You, you, you look, the, the, how does that come about? How does, you know, explain that for us. Sure. Well, I, I mentioned that one of my goals as a grandfather is to be the grandfather to my grandson that my grandfather was to me. My creativity comes from my grandfather. He could build anything. He had this innate capacity to see a finished product in his mind and then to replicate it on the material plane. So my creativity comes from my grandfather. I am trained as an artist. 
as a designer. Uh, that's what my degree is in. Uh, it was only uh, after I discovered African history or the missing pages of African history that I began focusing on African history in the Nile Valley. But I've always dealt with history through the eyes of an artist. Artists have the capacity to see, to hear, to feel things that people who aren't trained in these sensibilities are uh, unable to do. So, um, and dog, I'm talking and I forgot the question. What was your question, Carl? The question is how do you, you know, how did you, because, oh, you know, film, we, film. I, yeah. got it, I got it, film. So when I watch a film, I watch a film through the eyes of an artist. You know, one of the best jobs that I had was a summer internship at Foot Code and Building Advertising in Chicago in 1972. And I worked with people who made commercials, who wrote commercials, who directed commercials, uh, and designed commercials. So I had a head start. I had like a six-month to one-year head start on the things that the public was going to see. And I realized when I'm watching a film that someone had to write it, someone had to to produce it, someone had to design it, someone had to direct it. And so I'm, I'm looking at all of these elements. So everything that you see in every frame of every picture, someone had to conceive in their minds. So I'm looking at the writing. I'm looking at the directing. I'm looking at the art direction. I'm looking at the things that are on the set. So I'm synthesizing films from multiple perspectives simultaneously, right? And so um, Sandra earlier was commenting on uh, the Black Panther film and and the Woman King film um, that, that that I was describing. And so I, I've done dozens of lectures on films, and some of them can be found on the IKG website. Uh, you can you can download um, those lectures on our website. But when I look at a film, I'm seeing it from multiple perspectives. And so there's a couple of films out right now that are worthy of seeing. Uh, uh, American fiction, um, Core Jefferson's uh, film is a phenomenal film that I'm encouraging every person to see. It's not going to get a lot of press uh, because of the the storyline which deals with American racism, which it turns on its head. But it's a phenomenal film. Jeffrey Wright uh, is acting his behind off. Jeffrey Wright is a son of Southeast D.C. and has done D.C. proud. Uh, another film that opens tomorrow is Ava DuVernay's latest film, Origins, which is a cinematic retelling of Isabella Wilkerson's classic publication, A Cast. Uh, Ava DuVernay is a is a young, brilliant uh, filmmaker who who brings spirit, who brings intelligence, who brings cultural competence to her filmmaking. I think it was about a year or two ago when Ava DuVernay was recognized for her ability. She started um, a new program, and she invited Haile Garima, who's one of her professors um, in film school in California. Haile Garima, uh, those in D.C. know, is the uh, founder of Sankofa Video and Books. He's the writer and director of the film, the classic film, Sankofa, which was produced 30, 30 years ago. And she invited Haile to come out to talk about Sankofa and also broker the deal for Sankofa to be available on uh, Netflix. And what was interesting, Haile is from Ethiopia. He is His father was a playwright. He incorporates history and culture in all of his films. Haile is an independent filmmaker. He works outside of Hollywood because he wants control of his narrative. And he's working, he's got a new film coming out uh, called Ethiopian Lions, uh, Italian Wolves, about the uh, second attempt of um, of Italians to conquer Ethiopia. Ethiopia is the only African country that was not colonized. Uh, Italy uh, tried to attack uh, or did attack Ethiopia twice. Haile is working on a five-part documentary that tells the story of Benito Mussolini's efforts to colonize Ethiopia. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I love filmmaking. I, I love good filmmakers. And so for our us to be able to produce, executive produce the Renoko Rashidi documentary, uh, showcases what we're able to do when we tell our story, and it's through the ASA Restoration Project that we are looking at other film projects to document the stories of other scholars 
whose stories need to be told. Uh, one quick story, and then and then I'll cut and let you uh, come back in, Carl. Um, in I think it was uh, 1999 or 2000, I was in Brazil, received a call from Jane Small, who told me that Wesley Snipes uh, was looking for someone to go to, to Egypt with Dr. Ben uh, because a film crew was going to be filming a documentary on him. So I had a, a chance to spend like three weeks in Egypt with uh, a film crew and, and Dr. Ben. I was ahead of the uh, the B, uh, the, the second uh, crew that was doing the B-roll footage to illustrate all the things that Dr. Ben was talking about. Um, that same Wesley Snipes also produced uh, the film, the beautiful classic film on John Henry Clark, A Great and Mighty Walk. It was Wesley's desire when he was growing up in Harlem, attending lectures at First World with Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Dr. Jeffries, James Small, and others, where Wesley said he was going to Hollywood, and after he got his 10-picture deal, he was going to start a film company called Amon Ra Films and produce documentaries about our scholars. Wesley started Amon Ra Films. He did The Great and Mighty Walk with Dr. Clark. They brought me on to help them with the documentary on, on, on Dr. Ben. And unfortunately, Wesley ran into his tax problems, and Dr. Ben's film was never completed. It's maybe about 90% done, but it was never completed. He had, Wesley also wanted to do a series a film on Dr. Welsing. She was going to be the third in the series. And so what we want to be able to do through the ASA Restoration Project is to tell the stories of those scholars that uh, teachers won't teach or Hollywood won't make films about. So we love to do something. You know, we're, we're in conversation now with Dr. Hilliard's family about doing something to, to put his story out there. Uh, we've been very close to Dr. Welsing's family and would love to do something on, on her and her family. I mean, Dr. Welsing was a powerhouse uh, herself, but she came from a family of powerful people. So there's stories that need to be written, stories that need to be put on the big screen and the small screen, and we need resources and competent people to tell those stories for the benefit of our community. All right. And we're just flat out of time. Tony Browder, thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep us in the loop on all those projects that you're working on so we can pass them on to our family. All right. Thank you, Carl, for this opportunity. And whenever you call, I'll answer. Let's All right. <laughs> Okay, brother. Keep it moving. Thank you, Tony Browder. That's chemitologist Tony Browder. Mm-hmm. Family, we're done for the day. Stay strong. Stay positive. Please stay healthy. We'll see you tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock, right here in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB. In the DMV, we're on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power.